Balcony, can you hear me? Okay, great. Welcome back to CS125. So today's a really exciting day, actually. I hope you guys had a great long weekend. I hope you've been keeping up with the homework. It's a beautiful day outside, but what I'm excited about today is that we're going to talk about a new way of working with data uh, in our computer programs. And there's several points at this, during this semester where we're gonna expand the kind of data that we can work with. And today is one of the most important moments because up until this point, we've seen some of the things that computers know how to do and some of the things that computers are good at, but it hasn't gotten very interesting yet. And that's mainly because of limitations with the type of data that we can actually work with and access. So, so far we've been talking about doing math and making decisions based on single data values. But today we're gonna talk about ways to store multiple data values together. And our initial exploration into richer use of data still comes with some important limitations, but it's still way more interesting than what we've been talking about so far. And it turns out you could do a lot with the new way of working with data that we're about to talk about. So one of the changes, I was looking at this lecture last night from last semester, and I was like, huh. Now I think I made a classic, in the past when I talked about this topic, I think I made a classic computer scientist mistake. So a lot of us love this stuff, we're very interested in it, but sometimes when we talk to people about it, particularly people who are new, we make this classic mistake, which is we kind of talk about how to do things before we talk about what or why you'd want to. And so I've essentially inverted the ordering of the topics today to try to give you a sense of why we have certain language constructs in Java that we're going to talk about later, okay? So we're going to talk about doing things over and over again very fast, but we're gonna start out talking about why we would do this. Why would we wanna repeat something? And it's mainly because of this new way of storing data. So, like I said, so far we've been talking primarily about ways to store single data values. Java's primitive types allow us to store a single integer or a single number with a floating point component or a single character or a single truth value. But again, this is really, really limited. There's not much a computer could do if all it could do is work with single values. We want to, hello. <laughs> That's interesting. Let's see what happens, okay. Someone has hacked into my Chromecast. Don't do that, okay? This whole setup here is like about to fall apart at any moment, right? So hopefully that's not a precursor of bad things that are to come. All right, so we're talking about single data values and Java does primitive types allow us to work with those, but Let's try to, you know, in, enrich our vocabulary here. What if I want to work with multiple values? So I can create multiple variables, but I want to work with two ints. I could create two int variables and give them each names. But again, that's still really limiting. It gets messy very quickly. What I really want to do is I want to be able to work with an arbitrary number of values. And for now, let me put into place this stipulation this restriction, which is they all have to be of the same type. So what could we do if we could take those Java primitive types, and instead of working with one at a time, we could work with a bunch of them at a time. What new kinds of information? Like I said, this is a huge, you know, explosion in our ability to work with data, because what new kinds of data can we now represent and work with in our computer program? Somebody give me an example. I'm sure you can think of one, yeah, in the back. A string. Yeah, text. What is text? Text is a series of characters. So we have the primitive type available we need to represent this really interesting data source. The stuff you can do with text, this is actually one of the things that computer science has come to sort of late, because human speech is actually really messy and hard for computers to work with. But now that we've been able to mine text, we've also taken some time to get all this data into our computer systems, right? So all the work that, you know, various organizations have done. Oh, wow, it's like, don't do that. All the work that various organizations have done at digitizing textual information. So once you take all of those books in the library and turn them into text, turn them into sequences of characters, now computers could work with them and computers could actually do really fascinating things with that information. We're just getting started seeing the kind of impact that that's gonna have. So things like the Google Books Project are not, I don't know what that is, but it is bothering me too. So let's see if, is one of you making that noise? Okay. Let's 
see here. Want this? Try unplugging this guy. Not bad. Okay, is that gonna drive you guys nuts? I don't know what is making that high-pitched whine, but not much I can do about it. Okay, so text, back to text. So once we you know, start to be able to allow computers to work with text, there's all sorts of really cool things that we can do with that. So strings, what else? Yeah. Okay, yeah, so a, a table is really just, you know, uh, you know it's two-dimensional, but on some level I can take that and flatten it into one sequence of, of data, and so now I can start to associate multiple values with each other, like in a spreadsheet. What else? What about if we just think about single uh, series of data, right? Text is one thing. What else? There's all sorts of stuff out there. Yeah. DNA, right? What is the human genome? Yeah, someone is good at reading the slides. There we go. Thank you. Wow. Right? You're following along. That's good. You're going to get participation points for today. Um, yeah, so DNA, right? Your uh, cells are data. We've turned them into data. We've turned them into data by digitizing that information, right? Once it's stored in a computer, now, you know, computers can use that information to do really cool stuff, right? Okay? What else? Time series data. Like, Anything that happens in time that you can measure, like temperature, right? Um, like humidity, air pressure, all the stuff about, you know, the world around us, right? What's a particularly interesting seri uh, time series data that you could potentially, uh, that you guys probably see, enjoy all the time? It's up here on the slides. Music. Music is a form of time series data. It's just a bunch of measurements of air pressure. That's what sound is. My voice, whether it's reaching you through the speakers or through the air, is causing the air to vibrate, right? And the microphone is turning those vibrations into a series of measurements, which are then being transmitted over there. And somewhere in this process, something is interfering with this whole system and causing this high-pitched uh, scream, okay? So again, arrays may seem really basic. We're talking about them at its week one, but they're super powerful because they really dramatically expand the kind of data that we can work with. The other thing I want you to recognize about arrays, and this is not a class about learning about how the low-level details of your computer actually work, but the most accurate representation of how your computer actually stores information internally is that everything is one giant, huge array of integers. So if your computer has 32 gigabytes of RAM, that means while it's running, it can remember 32 billion numbers. And the way those are organized is as one long series. And obviously you guys could go on and take multiple future courses about how that actually works in practice and how we make that okay. But that's how it works. All right, so an array in Java represents a series of zero or more values of the same type. So there's our limitation. We will talk later in the semester. And of course, things get a lot more interesting once we start talking about the data that we can represent when we start mixing different types of information together. So a little bit of characters, a few integers, and now I can represent information about a person, right? They might have a name and an age and a weight and stuff like that. But for now, we're talking about a series of the same type. Now, you can create an empty array in Java. It's not particularly useful, but you can do it. Um, but this is the limitation in Java. The arrays have to have the same type, right? Um, so arrays are actually awesome. I want to make this clear because this is really important. It's important to understand some of these concepts when we talk about the easy instances of them so that you have a mental model when we start talking about more complicated things. So we have a whole course that you guys will take in a few semesters on data structures. But arrays are a data structure. Data structures, as their name implies, add structure to data. They take, addition, they take data, the raw data, and they structure it in a way so that there's additional information added to it. So arrays are an example of doing this. So what, what does an array do to data? 
So imagine I have like a deck of cards sitting here that's all jumbled up, and I put the cards into some order. I've created an array of, that consists of those cards. The data is the cards. The array has put them in order. So now there's an additional piece of data, sometimes we call this metadata, data about data, that I've added to the system. I not only still have the cards, but now each card has a place in my ordering, okay? It has a position. So arrays put values in order, and the order in order data is really important. So for example, if I took the human genome, the human genome only has four symbols in it, okay? So if I took it and I just jumbled it all up, it doesn't work anymore, right? It wouldn't create, then the proteins required to create life, it's just a mess, right? It would just, there's nothing there, there's no information. Same thing, for example, if I took music. Music, at its fundamental level, digital music is just a series of numbers that are in a very specific order, but if I take those numbers and just jumble them up, throw them all over the place, I get noise. It sounds actually probably a lot like white noise, right? It's not music anymore, I've lost the structure. So when you take away the structure that arrays bring to data, a lot of times what you have left is nothing. And so the structure is an important part of what the array is doing. All right. So once I put values into an array, I have an additional piece of information about them that I refer to as the index. That's their position in the array. So again, any data structure adds structure to data, and the structure itself is data. The structure is information. So once I put values into an array, not only do I still have the values, but I also have, each has a position in the array. So I've added information. All right, so let's look at some syntax for actually doing this in Java. So on line two of my example, I'm showing you how to declare a single integer. This is review from last time. And on line four, I'm declaring an array of integers. And you'll see what I've added here is this bracket syntax. So when I put brackets after the type in Java, I'm telling the computer this variable called multiple is not just gonna store one int, it's gonna store multiple integers. It's gonna store an array of integers. So I'm taking a num some number of integers. I don't know how many yet. We're gonna come to that in a minute. But this variable is not just gonna store one, it's gonna store more than one, zero or more integers. So I have the type and I have the bracket syntax to indicate that this is an array. I can do this with all of the Java primitive types. So down here I've created an array of characters. On line seven, my review, I'm declaring a variable called one that stores a single character. On line nine, I'm declaring a variable called all that stores an array of characters, okay? So this bracket syntax is how I tell the computer this variable is not just storing a single value, it's gonna store more than one value, usually. So when I declare an array, it's empty, but I also have to tell Java how many elements I'm gonna put in it. And this is one of the limitations of this data structure in Java, that if you've learned some Python or if you've learned some JavaScript or even languages like Go or whatever, you may, or Rust, you may not be familiar with this limitation. But this limitation is actually goes back a long time to the earliest computer languages. So when I create an array in Java, I have to tell the computer how large it is before I start using it, and then afterwards, I can't change the size of that array. Now, I can, you know, uh, create a new array that's bigger and copy the data over and stuff like that, but the original array is always going to be the same size. So the array size is set when I initialize and declare the array. So on line two, I'm creating an array of integers. What's the name of the array? Multiple. And then on the right side, I have an initialization. When I initialized a single value, I typically had a literal over there, but I could also have another variable. Here, I have some new syntax, literally new syntax. So you see a keyword here, new, the same type that's over here on the left side, and then inside the brackets, I have a literal. And that tells Java how many elements I want this array to store. So this is an array that's gonna store eight integers, okay? So this says, Java, please create an array, a new array, to store eight integers, and I'm gonna refer to that array using the variable name multiple. 
Well, Reason and Java have this nice feature, which is they, they know how long they are. They know how many elements they have. So once I have an array, again, this is a new piece of syntax. So the syntax is gonna make more sense to you later, but this is one of the unfortunate things about Java is that we just kinda have to push it at you right now, and you're just gonna have to wrap your head around it. Later when we talk about objects, you'll see where this dot notation comes from. But for now, if I want to access the length of the array, I can do so by picking the variable name that I declared that stores, that refer to the array, dot length, this special uh, keyword, length. Length always gets me the value of the array. Down here, I can also split these into two parts. So here I'm declaring that all is going to store an array of characters, and then I initialize it to hold four characters down here. All right, questions about this? Again, we're seeing new syntax here for those of you that are new to Java or new to programming. So we will give you lots of practice with this. Okay, awesome. When I initialize array, I can also put initial values into it if I want to. So I can both initialize the array and fill it with the data that I want it to contain, at least when I get started. So here's an example. On the left side, I'm telling Java that I'm declaring an integer array called multiple, and on the right side, I have these curly braces, and inside, I have a series of literal values separated by commas. So this creates an, how large is this array? Four, why don't I have to tell Java that anywhere? Because it can count. The computer can count. It says, okay, well, I'm looking inside here and I see four values. So I'm gonna initialize this to be of size four. Same thing down here, right? So I can create a character array and initialize it as well, right? So I don't have to specify the size here because Java can figure it out based on how I initialize the array. So this array is gonna have size three because it looks inside the curly braces and it sees three values. Okay, so now I've showed you how to declare arrays, how to set their size, how to initialize them in the initial values, but Usually what we do with an array is we want to use it to store data, and so we want a way to get at the data that's in the array. And it's frequently important to be able to get at the data in an array at a specific spot. Remember, the position of data in the array is really meaningful. So for example, when people look for patterns in the human genome, they take the human genome as an array of values, and they go through it one by one in order looking for different types of patterns in the data. So I want to be able to figure out what value is at a particular location in my data structure, in my array. In Java, I do this using something called bracket notation. So these are square brackets. If I want to access, we're, we're, we'll get to a playground in a minute. I know this has been a lot of just, you know, uh, new syntax, but we're, we'll do an example in a sec. So here on line two, on line one, I've created a, an integer array called twos, and I've initialized it with three values, so this has size three. What this piece of syntax here does is it retrieves the value at index zero in the array. And again, for those of you that are new to computer science, this is a little bit weird, okay? Index zero is the first element in the array. So what is that going to print? The slides say it's gonna print one. That's the first element. So this is why we refer to this as week one of CS125, because when was week zero? Last week, right? Computer scientists, you will get used to this and you will start to do it and people around you will find you annoying because you do it, but you will start numbering things at zero. Okay, zero is actually the first number, all right? So this is our first value in the arrays at index zero. I can also set values in a Java array using similar syntax. So here on line three, I'm modifying the first value in the array. I'm changing it. Originally, it was one. Thank you, Greg. And now it's two. I've set it to two. I've assigned it to two. So this says assign the value in the array twos at position zero, which is the first value, to be two. And just like I did variable assignment, I can assign values into an array using a literal, I can assign them into using a variable, I can do any kind of assignment that works. Okay, so let's, so, so again, 
that what's, what's interesting and important about arrays is two things. First of all, it's our first chance to work with multiple values, okay? The second thing is that arrays associate this new piece of data, metadata, structure, with the data inside the array. So once I create an array, I've added data to the system. I know not only the values inside, but every value has a position, and the positions tend to be meaningful, right? So again, the data is the context. It's the actual values that's stored inside the array. The metadata is the position, the order that I've added. That's the structure that this data structure, this simple data structure brings. All right, questions about arrays? I promised we get to a playground, but actually I think that's gonna come later. Yeah. Yeah, so this is, so the question is, can you have different types of data in the same array? And the answer is no. In Java, an array, every value in the array has to be the same type. And again, you probably are starting to, like, see the limitations of that. There's certain types of data that I can't work with because it requires mixing different types of information. We will get there. That will be the next big expansion of the kind of data that we can work with in this class when we get to objects and we start talking about how to represent more complex pieces of data. So other, uh, the other thing to point out is other programming languages allow you to do this. So in Python, I can have a list that has some integers and then a few strings and then a couple of floating point values, and we don't do that in Java. And that may seem like a limitation, but it turns out that it also makes our code a lot easier to reason about and safer. In Python, if you have a list of elements, you have no idea what's in there. In Java, you know. You know they're all integers. Great question. Another question about right. Yeah. Ah, okay, so the question is, what are the initial values that are stored if I create an empty array? Come, uh, ask me that question in a minute, I'll show you. Yeah, so the question is, if I create, let's say, let's say I go back here, and I create that array down there, all, what's inside of it right now? What would happen if I printed the first value at index zero? I'll, I'll, we'll talk about this in a sec. Great question. Because it's the easiest to just do this using the playground, yeah. Uh, yes, so the question is, if I want to append a value to an array, like I want the array to get bigger, yes, I essentially have to create a new array, copy all the data over, and then add the value at the end, right? We will talk about this later. Later in the class, once we start to implement some more interesting data structures, we will implement a more flexible version of an array that's called a list that allows me to add and remove elements from it, and you will see how we have to copy everything over in order to do that. Great question. Okay. So, now we have this way of storing multiple data values, all right? But, we don't really have a, a useful idioms for working with these data values, right? So, for example, now I could give you, you could store all of, you know, the text in the U.S. Constitution or the records of the Library of Congress. But what if I wanted you to do something like go through and count the number of times that the letter W appears, for example. So it's all text. So this is a huge array of characters. But I don't wanna, like, I can't, and I've seen how to get one value out. So I can get the value at, at location 38, or the value at location 297. But that's not what I wanna do. What I wanna do is I wanna write code that actually goes through the array value by value, one at a time, and figures out what to do. And so this brings us to the second half of today's class, where we, we go back and we talk about one of the other things that computers are extremely good at, which is doing things over and over quickly. Okay? And a lot of times, the repeated operations that we're performing when a computer is running are working with some type of array-like data structure or data that's stored in an array. It's not always, but this is common. So again, when I play music, right? Like, when I'm, you know, so right now, my computer is sending the screen over to that device over there. And what it's doing is, frequently, it's taking all the data from the screen 
and it's sending that data over there. Okay, so it's doing this over and over and over extremely quickly, which is why when I change the slide, you see it up there. So the construct that we use, the new piece of language syntax that we use in Java, or the, the way that we describe this process is a loop, right? It makes sense. When you're in a loop, you're going in a circle, doing the same thing over and over again. Loops are also one of the basic building blocks for working with data in arrays. So again, the data is what's exciting here, right? Data science is this hot new term, which to me I find really amusing because computer scientists have always worked with data. That's, only, that's the only thing your program ever does. Right? So the idea that somehow there's this new thing called data science is a little funny. I'm happy that people are excited about it, right? But this is not new to computer scientists. We have always worked with data. That is what you will do for the rest of your life. But if we want to process a lot of data, we need to be able to do things over and over again. So we need to use this construct called a loop. So this requires introducing a couple of new pieces of Java syntax. The first one, the simplest possible loop. The one that we'll start with is called a while loop. So here's the simplest possible loop in Java. I'm showing you here. So again, I've got some new pieces of syntax. So let's slow down and let's examine this together. Last time we talked about if statements. That was one of our first examples of new syntax. This is a special way of instructing the computer to do something. While is another one, okay? So while is another one of these special words that has special meaning to Java. You can't call a variable while, okay? Because it's a, what's known as a reserved word. It's reserved because it means something else. So here's the syntax of a while loop. I have the word while. Then in parentheses, I have a condition. This is a conditional expression. It's something that needs to evaluate to a Boolean. Now here I'm using a Boolean literal, but that's not very common. Usually what I do is I have some type of test that I'm doing in there. Is a number smaller than another number or something like that that I'm using to determine whether or not I should continue to run this piece of code. And then I have a block. So we saw these before when we talked about if and else statements. The code inside the block is what I'm going to repeat. And just like with if and else, I can put anything I want in there. I can write a whole big program inside that while loop if I want to. What goes inside that block can be anything that I want. It's indented to the right so that it's more readable, so I can tell what's inside the block. But I have an open curly brace, closed curly brace, code inside the block. As long as the condition is true, Java will continue to execute that code. So it'll start here on line two, it'll run any code inside the block, and then it will return to the top. Every time it gets back to the top of the loop, it reevaluates the condition. So when will this loop stop executing? So Java's gonna get there and it's gonna say, okay, while is the condition true? Yeah, so what do I do? Run the code inside the block. Okay, I'm back at the top now. Is the condition true? What do I do next? I could just be stuck here all semester, right? Um, yeah, I'm just gonna repeat this over and over. That, that's, that's what this will do. This will literally repeat the code until something stops it. You or some other sort of other process, right? So again, the while loop has two parts. There's a block of code to repeat, that's inside the braces, and there's a condition that has to be true every time I start the loop. So if the condition isn't true, the loop doesn't run, okay? As soon as that condition evaluates to false, Java will stop executing the code. It will not rerun the block. Instead, it will continue below the while loop. So it'll jump down below the block of code that I declared to be my loop and will keep running, okay? So let's experiment with this. Okay, so let's think about what we expect to happen with this piece of code. So I've got an index that's an int variable, and my while loop is checking whether or not that index is less than four. If it's less than four, what happens? What code gets run? What's the first line of code that gets run? Yeah. Yeah, so if 
index is less than four, I enter this block that starts on line three, and I run the code inside of it, okay? So I print the index, and then what do I do on line four? Uh, it's a good review of our variable updates. It's very common, what do I do? Yeah. I increase index by one. So this is equivalent to index is equal to index plus one, or index plus equals one. This is a shortcut for incrementing index by one. Then what do I do? I go back to the condition. So I test the condition again. So the first time I went through the loop, index was zero, because I had initialized it here. The second time I go through the loop, what's the value of index? One, is it less than four? So I execute the code again, and I incre increment index. Now I get to the top, what's index now? Two, is it less than four? You can kind of see where this is going. Let's run the code. It's been too long since we've had a little bit of fun. Okay. So let's think about what just happened. The first time I came through the loop, index was zero. I added one, I went back to the top. Index was less than four, so I continue, and I added one, two, and three. So let's think about what happens after I print index is equal to three. So when I get to line three and index is three, I add one to it. So what's the value of index now? Is four less than four? No, and so that loop stops executing. So Java goes to the top, it says is index less than four? No, and it jumps to the bottom and prints stuff, okay? So, we now have this fantastic power at our fingertips. We can make computers do things over and over and over again. This is the efficiency that Clive Thompson talks about in coders. The ability to repeat stuff over and over again. The ability to, you know, do drudge work for you. A computer, you know, this is boring to a human, right? Imagine that the thing inside this loop is like the worst, the most boring thing that you have to do, right? Like mow the lawn. Maybe you like mowing the lawn, right? Um, wash a dish or something like that, right? And you can now tell the computer to do it, right? It doesn't care, it doesn't get tired. I have had computers do some incredibly gnarly things for me and not once has one ever complained, okay? They don't complain, they don't get tired, they don't take time off, they always show up on time. They're incredibly good at doing this type of really, really boring drudge work, all right? But we typically want them to stop at some point. An unterminated loop will stop at some point. Now what causes it to stop can be a variety of different things, right? Um, so if you run in our test, what'll happen is at some point we'll be like, wait, this code has run for way too long. I asked you to print hello world 10 times, that shouldn't take 10 seconds, right? Something has gone awry and we'll, we'll terminate the code. Um, but normally this is a problem, right? So, so and, and this can occur, you know, you don't have to be malicious, right? So there's an anecdote, and I actually remember this, um, there's an anecdote in the next chapter of the book talking about basic programming. Anyone, anyone program in basic? Okay, that's good, actually. Uh, basic was uh, a language that had a lot of issues, but it was kind of fun, it was simple, and so, you know, I remember, you know, with the old computers at my, at my school, like writing a little piece of code that would just print like a bad word over and over again, right? On the screen, because the teacher couldn't turn it off. That was the best thing about it, right? You know, and then the teachers figured out, okay, well, there's this special two keys that if I hit together, it'll stop it. And then we came up with like nastier versions of it, right? That you actually literally had to turn the computer off, right, to get it to stop, right? So anyway, they didn't, they didn't like that. I spent a lot of time in middle school sweeping the parking lot. I'll just point, point that out. That wasn't always why, but there were other reasons. So here's an example of us doing this in a non-malicious way. We just made a mistake, okay? So what's gonna happen when I run this piece of code? All right, so this looks a lot like the example I just did. I start with an index, it's zero. I enter the loop. I'm checking if it's less than four. I print it, and then I, oh, but here's the problem, right? I subtract one, okay, so let's see what happens. Okay, so now it's negative one. Is negative one less than four? Yes, so I continue. This is not going well, right? 
the thing that stopped my loop before was that index was getting bigger, and so eventually it was gonna reach four, and that condition was not gonna be true anymore. Here, index is getting smaller. So let's see what happens if I run the code. Okay, so if I run the code, our helpful uh, playground will actually print like a lot of values, right? And then, down here at the very bottom, it will tell you that the program timed out. What does that mean? It means that I killed the program. My code killed your program. That's really actually what happened. My code in this case killed my program, because my program was bad and wasn't stopping. It also points out that there were like 200,000 lines that aren't shown here, right? So this actually made a lot of progress before I got around to turning it off, okay? So this is an example of an unterminated loop. You can also just do this. But at this point, you're writing code that's malicious, right? Like here, you're just trying to mess with things, right? Um, again, you know, you can run this and, you know, eventually it'll print a lot of stuff and then time out. Okay. So one of the things that, that uh, language designers will do is when they identify a pattern that people are using in their code, they'll try to make it easier, okay? And so a, a lot of times when we write a while loop, we're, we're uh, performing something a certain number of times. We might be going through every value in an array, or we might be doing a particular operation a certain number of times that we know beforehand. And so this type of pattern is very common. If all I had was a while loop, in the entire world, I would write a lot of code that looked like this. I create an index, I set that index to zero, I repeat the while loop while the index is less than some value, and every time I go through, I add one. The result of this pattern is that whatever is inside the loop gets executed however many times according to the condition that is set inside the loop. So if I use four, is my literal here, how many times will this code get executed? What if I change it to 10? And it gets executed 10 times. What if I change it to 100? Yeah, so I'm basically doing something a certain number of times, and I'm controlling the number of times that this is done by changing this one value, okay? And so rather than forcing you to write this over and over again, we have a special piece of loop syntax. We have a new kind of loop that I'm gonna show you that's designed to help handle this. This is called a for loop. So we've looked at a while loop. A while loop is simpler than a for loop. A for loop starts to get a little bit more interesting. So this while loop up top is equivalent to this for loop, okay? So let's go through this carefully, step by step. So again, for is a reserved word in Java. You can't have a variable called for. It has special meaning to Java. It means that you're creating a loop. For loops work differently than while loops. So you'll see on some level they look similar. I've got four and then I've got some parentheses. But in a while loop, I had one thing inside those parentheses, a condition that I checked every time I entered the loop. In a for loop, I've got three things. For loops have three parts, okay? So if I go from left to right, the first part is an initialization step. This happens once the first time the for loop is uh, entered. The second is a condition. This is checked every time I enter the for loop, including the first time. The final part is an update, sometimes we refer to as an update statement. So that runs every time the loop repeats. It does not run the first time. So the way Java executes this is it says, okay, I'm gonna create a variable called, I can declare variables inside this. That's actually quite useful. So I'm gonna declare a variable called index of type int and initialize it to zero. Then I'm going to run, I'm gonna check whether or not it's less than four. It is less than four. I'm gonna execute the body of the loop. When I get to the top, I'm going to run my update statement, so index is now one, and then I'm gonna check the condition again. And if it's still true, I'll run the loop again, okay? So the parts of this are, are, are sometimes confusing to think about, right? But one of the ways that you can help yourself understand how for loops work is by rewriting them as while loops, and vice versa. So I can take a while loop and rewrite it as a for loop, okay? So let's do that. So let's take our while loop here, and I'm gonna run it to, to see what it does. So this is the behavior that I expect. And now let's rewrite this as a for loop. So the first thing I need to do is I need to change the while to a four. 
okay? I'm gonna move this bit of initialization that I did up here on line two into the, uh, it, that's the first thing I do in the for loop, that's my initialization step. I have the condition already there. The last thing I need to do is move this update statement out of the loop in, into, out of the loop body and into the for loop declaration. So this is the same loop, okay? Should be, let's run it and make sure it does the same thing. It does, okay, good. And again, you can also take a for loop like this and rewrite it as a while loop. If I wanted to use a while loop here, I need to declare my variable out before the loop because I can't do that in a while loop. I have to remove everything except the conditional and I need to stick the update statement inside the loop. So there, there's going back the other direction. All right, I'll leave this for you guys to practice later. So for loops are more complicated than while loops. While loops are simple, it's just a condition. If it's true, execute the body of the loop. If not, stop. Um, you will get used to for loops. This is one of those things that, you know, by the time you're done with this class, one of the reasons why we do the daily homework, one of the reasons why we do the weekly quizzes is to get you to practice this stuff. Because by the end of the day, by the end of your life as a computer programmer, however many decades that lasts, however many problems you solve, all the cool ways you guys are gonna change the world, right? And I'm relying on that, right? Because I'm getting old. I'm getting gonna get older in a couple weeks, right? And you guys, you know, I, you know, and at some point, I'm not there yet, but at some point I'm gonna like stop learning the new languages and stuff like that. And I'm, you know, I'm gonna be using the stuff that no one wants to use anymore, right? And then you guys have to go on and actually make the world a better place. So at some point later, you will think about how many for loops have I written in my life? I don't know, I, I don't know. Hundreds of thousands for me, right? You just that you just start to do them, right? You don't think about them. They just flow off your fingertips. This is like learning to write, okay? Here's what to keep in mind when you're getting started. The initialization step, the first part of that for loop body only happens once, the first time the for loop is executed. The conditional is actually evaluated every time. So if the conditional is true, I enter the loop. If it's false, I don't. This isn't true even on the first time that I get to the loop. So if the condition starts out false, the loop is never executed. The loop body is just skipped and I keep going. And then the update is only performed after the block executes. So the first time I don't do the update. I only do it after the block executes. And it's also performed before I check the condition. So when I get to the bottom, I go back to the top, perform my update statement, check the condition. If the condition is still true, I keep going. Otherwise, I stop. All right. So this is basically the algorithm that Java is executing. We'll talk more about algorithms on Friday. This is the series of steps that Java executes when it runs a for loop. Check the condition. If the condition is false, continue execution. If the condition is true, rerun the block, and then after the block finishes, update, run the update state. And repeat this until it's not true. Okay, so I'm not gonna go through these in detail, but I'll, I'll let you guys, this is a good thing to do. So you're not gonna see very many loops like this, okay? Most of the loops that you see are gonna start a variable at zero, it's gonna be less than some value, and you're gonna increment up by one. I suspect that 98% of the four loops I've written in my life are that kind, okay? This is not very common. But let's think about it because we're learning this stuff, right? So. Here, what's, what am I initializing? Well, so what's the variable that I'm initializing as part of my loop? What's it called? My for loop. It's actually called loop here, right? So this says initialize, declare a variable called loop, initialize it to four. What am I checking against? I'm checking that it's less than or equal to eight. And how am I updating it? Actually adding two rather than one. Okay, so let's see what happens when I run this. How many times this is gonna execute? Three. When it starts, it's four. Is four less than or equal to eight? Yes. I execute the loop. Next time I come through, loop is six when I check the condition, right? Is six less than or equal to eight? Yes, that's the second time through. When I, the third time through, what's the value of loop? Eight, is eight less than or equal to eight? It is. Go through the loop, update, 
add two, loop is now 10, is 10 less than or equal to eight? No, so I stop, okay? I, again, I will leave these up for you guys to review. Um, we, you know, unfortunately, these type of statements are great fodder for quiz questions. Um, so you will see a couple of things like this on next week's quiz. So please go over these and ask um, if you need help on the form. So just a little bit of esoterica before we go on to a couple more important things. So all three parts of a for loop are not required. The three parts are the parts that are separated by semicolons inside those parentheses. So I had my initialization, semicolon, check, semicolon, update. I don't have to, to do those. And again, these are so rare, okay? You know, I mean, I'm only putting them up there because just in case you see them in the future, you have some sense of the fact that this is okay. We will probably not show you code that, that looks like this because it's just not very common, right? But again, I can leave out the, the variable declaration. So here, I'm not declaring any variables as part of my for loop. I'm just using the one that already exists. Here, I'm not updating the variable in the for loop. I'm just checking a condition. This is essentially equivalent to a while loop. And then down here, I'm not checking the condition or updating the variable, and this is essentially equivalent to a while true loop. We'll never stop. Okay. And again, a good thing to do to practice is if you get confused by this, rewrite the for loop as a while loop, and that'll help, because while loops are simpler to reason with. Okay, last two things I wanna talk about are two important statements, two important um, things I can do inside a loop that will affect the loop execution. And we'll talk more about these on Friday as we start to develop some simple algorithms using the programming tools that, that we have in our tool bag now, okay? So, break. The, again, these are special keywords in Java. They're special to the computer, okay? Break means immediately execute the enclosing loop. Why would I use a break statement? Maybe I was going through a big array of data and I found a value that I was looking for, so I wanna stop. I don't need to look at the rest of the data, okay? Break will terminate the loop. Once I hit break, I jump out of the loop and keep going. I don't reevaluate the condition, I don't update the variable, I just stop. I just jump out of the loop immediately and execute any code that's below that loop. Continue is a little bit more interesting. So what continue does is it jumps back to the top of the loop immediately. And then everything that would normally happen, happens. So if it's a while loop, I check the condition. If it's a for loop, I update the variable and check the condition. So continue essentially says, go back to the top and keep going. Maybe this piece of data in the array that I'm looking at or is, isn't interesting. Maybe I don't want to do anything with it, I'm just gonna keep going, okay? So, what's gonna happen here? Let me put a little bit of extra logging in here. Uh, I'll put, all right. What do you guys think's gonna happen here? So again, I've got, now I've got some new stuff going on. This is exciting, I'm starting to combine things together. I've got a loop with a conditional inside of it, okay? And again, we'll talk more about this on Friday when we start to talk about what an algorithm is and how we would build one using these tools that we have. But here I've got a for loop, so I'm going through a series of integers. Inside of it, I have an if statement. If the if statement is true, I'm gonna print something, and then I have this break keyword. What does that break keyword do? Stops the loop immediately, okay? So let's run this and see what happens, okay? So I go through, not found, not found, not found, and then at the very end, I find the value I'm looking for. Okay, so this is where I'm gonna stop for today. We'll talk about continue next time. Um, just a few announcements as you guys pack up. Homework continues today, homework continues every day. The homework problems are now due on the day they are assigned. This is the way things will work until December, okay? Um, we have office hours today starting at noon. If you didn't finish setting up Android Studio and you probably didn't in lab, please plan on coming to office hours this week to take care of that. We have an, the machine project will be out on Friday. I don't have office hours today. I will see you guys on Friday.